enough people to get started, I guess. Yep. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the IOSO slash DC IOS shared meetup June uh, 2021 edition special dot dot DC lightning talks. Uh, this is a very special one because today we have like a lot more speakers than usual. So just to give you a little update or um, um, background, I guess, on iOS Soho, we are a meetup based in New York City. We meet uh, one same month usually. Uh, back before the pandemic, we met in person. We have been doing online events with DC iOS for a while now, and we usually have two technical talks, 20 minutes each. Um, and uh, and we do it over and over again every month. And this, this, this month is a bit special, as I said before. We're going to go into details very soon about that. I'm going to pass it to Joseph very quickly to introduce DC iOS. Yeah, and DC iOS is somewhere we host there in the DMV area. Um, host it usually second Tuesday of the month uh, when we're when we're you know actually in person. Uh, usually hosted at Capital One offices, um, and we usually have a bunch of food and and uh, really great speakers. So um, we've went online uh, as well, and we've been online since the pandemic has started. Uh, so this virtual meetup has been great because we've been able to bring in speakers um, from all around the United States and, and international, which has been really cool. Uh, and we've got to link up with Paul in New York uh, with his iOS Soho, uh, just bringing more talent and, and uh, people together uh, to form a larger community here uh, at this virtual meetup. So super excited to have all the speakers today as, as well as all the attendees and really excited to uh, hear what everyone has to talk about. Awesome. Thank you. Um, a quick note before we get started, we are still beta in a way, you know, we haven't done that many meetups online, so we're still figuring out the best format, so if you have any feedback for us, we always like looking for it, so feel free to reach out. Everybody should be muted. If you're not, well, I guess you should be. Uh, speakers will be unmuted uh, when time comes for them to speak, we're trying to keep that muted, so to make sure we don't disturb the recording, and like I just said, we are recording. Uh, tonight, we have some uh, nine of them, lightning talks, it's going to be awesome. If you have seen the description or tweets we have put out there, we have a raffle. So we're going to be giving away like two uh, tickets to the upcoming conference, I360 uh, iDev, which happens in Denver in, uh, in, uh, in August, uh, which also has an online format, you don't have to be in person, as well as a few uh, Apple gift cards, we'll get into that in a minute. At the end of uh, the uh, nine talks and raffle, we'll be going into a little bit of announcements uh, where we will tell you about uh, what's coming next and offer for you as well to make an announcement if you'd like. And finally, <clears throat> we'll go into like a networking session where we will actually use the Zoom uh, breakout room uh, feature where we will actually create one room per talk as well as one general common uh, topics uh, room as well as one for people who are either hiring or um, are looking for a job, and we'll talk a bit more about that when we get there. Tonight, and here's what you're for, here for, hopefully not just for the raffle, we have nine uh, speakers and talks uh, lined up for you with a lot of different topics presented this year at WC. I'm not going to get too much in detail right now, you'll, you'll get, we'll get there very soon, but uh, as you can see, lots of things, very interesting, very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I guess I have one more slide before we get into the first talk. Like I said before, two tickets to raffle. The way it's going to work is after, towards the end, after seven talks, basically, we will send an, a link in the chat for people to sign up to the raffle. If you're interested in getting either one of these prizes, we have $200 gift cards from uh, uh, Apple, basically not from Apple, but for the Apple um, store, and as well as A25 dollars. All of that is going to be up uh, in, in the raffle. And if you are interested in getting one of the things, you will have to enter your name in, uh, in this form we'll share later on. And at the very end, we'll pull uh, names of the buckets uh, and let, let you know by the end of the meetup who are the winners. And we'll send that over to you over email. And for those of you who want to go to the conference and don't uh, win a ticket tonight, as you can see, if you use this uh, code, you should be able to get 20% off. They have prizes for people who attend in person as well as an online uh, prize, which is a lot cheaper. Anyways, that's it for, for this like quick intro. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Victor, who is going to talk to us about what's new in Xcode. And I'm going to stop sharing, and we have to unmute you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Victor Lopez, and let me 
start my presentation. So good afternoon. Um, I'm Victor Lopez again. I've been working in Capital One for like almost eight years. I'm currently a tech lead on one of like the car platform teams on the flagship app. And today I'm going to talk about what's new in Exo 13. So here are some of the features that were introduced in Exo 13 as part of like their beta one. Um, I'm going to demo some of these new features. Some others, like the last three, I'm not going to demo. I'm just going to go like and do like an overview because they have so much information that they need their own presentation. Fortunately, we'll have one for Doc C uh, by Joseph. So looking forward to that one. So let's just go directly to Xcode to see what changed. Um, can you all see Xcode now? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Um, so we can see that there are some UI tweaks, mainly on the navigator. And um, here we see that we don't have the file extensions anymore. Instead, we have some nice icon, nice icons. And we can always see the file extensions again. If we go to settings, if we go to general, and then we go here to file extensions, we can show everything, or we can show some of them if we specify the file extensions. And personally, now I like the, the new version because I prefer like the icons. Um, also, if we have like some sort of error, um, instead of like seeing the errors in like kind of like an inline version, we can see them minimized. So then they don't like bother us. We can always click it and like see the actual error. Um, so also we have like some new additions for, for new features for like the autocomplete in, in, in Xcode, um, which are very, very useful. So switches, if we have a switch, and in this case, I'm going to switch on this enum. Um, if I click this one, it will autocomplete with all the different cases, which is very useful because before you had to either put it manually or like wait for the compiler to like shout at you and then you could use like the autocomplete or like the fix the issue. But now you can like use the autocomplete. Also for unwrap optionals, now you can like use, if you're using either guard or let, it will like automatically, um, I give you sorry, um, give you like the, the 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 optional that you want to unwrap, and it will give you like exactly the same name. So it's also very very useful. And again, it works with guard and and if lets. Another nice um, autocomplete uh, feature, which was added, was like also for for loops. If you have something like an array in this case, which has a plural it will like auto detect the singular version of, of that plural and then like it will um, like basically auto complete the code for you. It also detects um, like irregular plurals like such as goose and geese, which is pretty, pretty cool. So maybe it uses like some AI there or like a, like a dictionary or something like that. Um, also now they have like deeper property findings. So if you have an object, within another object, it can like find like all those properties for like those embedded objects. So in this case, I want to get uh, like the instrument brand from the lead singer. So I'm going to return lead. And then in, again, here I want the brand, which is part of like, the instrument. So now we, we see that like, it auto detects that that brand comes from the instrument, which is a property of like this struct called band. So again, it's very, very useful. Finally, if we want to also use a framework that we don't have imported, like if we want to use a class or an object from any other framework that is, has, hasn't been imported, Xcode now will auto detect that like the object that we want to use is from a framework that needs to be imported and then it will like automatically add it. So for example, if I want to use view, here it will like tell me that it needs like Swift UI. So if I tap enter, it will automatically import Swift UI, which again is very, very useful. Another addition um, that Xcode has is um, column breakpoints. So same as like regular breakpoints, now you have um, some methods that are called on the same line. You can like add column breakpoints, so then you can like easily uh, check method by method to debug if you have any issue. And to do so, you go here, you say, and show code actions. And then you click here and set a column breakpoint. So 
So these column breakpoints work exactly as any other regular breakpoint. You can pull a name, you can put some conditions, you can put like a sound or whatever. And then you can just like remove it by easily dragging them out of, of, of the screen. Another very useful change that was introduced in Xcode were for SwiftUI, for like the previews. Um, now you can tap these buttons to rotate the device. And this only works for iOS 15. So you need to make sure like your app supports only iOS 15. Um, right now I'm having some issues. But then if you tap the button, it will like rotate the device. And also you'll see in the content preview how it like adds like the code for it to, to, to rotate it. Um, also something that was added to um, previews is like this accessibility inspector. Unfortunately, I cannot see it, but like here I have a, like a screenshot of how it looks like. It will have like very, very useful information about your views. Um, also, if you still use storyboards, they made some changes in the storyboards. So similarly to the Swift UI, now they have like an accessibility button. Oops. That has like some of those accessibility options. In this case, you can like select dynamic type to see how it's going to look like. You can also have like some other accessibility attributes like both text, etc. Um, so Xcode iOS 15 brings like new styles for buttons. And now storyboards enable you to like select like those styles from the storyboard itself. So in this case, I selected like the style uh, tinted. And also something that is new on Xcode 13 is like you can play with like the corners for these buttons. Let's try capsule. So now you can like see like those things without like putting it in the code. Um, another new thing that Xcode brings is beam um, key bindings. If you like, I know many people that are very, very interested in key bindings. So now you can like enable them from Xcode. For you to do so, you have to go here to settings, text editing, editing, and then enable beam key bindings. Um, as you can see, you do, oops, uh, you don't see it, but like you, you they, they add them at, at the end of the screen. They add like some of like the, um, the keywords. So personally, I don't use Vim, but like now I'm going to be like a little bit more interested because I've heard like it's very, very powerful. So then and we have a talk about that at the end. One of the presentations is just about that. Perfect. So looking forward to that one. Someone asked in the chat if you can increase your font. Sorry, I, don't, I didn't see that earlier. Oh, but... sure. Yeah. I mean, sorry. Um, another new feature that Xcode introduced was version control. I mean, it's not new, but like they put more stuff for version control. As we can see now, uh, again, like the UI of Xcode is a little bit different. And as we can see here, now they are putting like more emphasis on version control. So this project has, uh, like I, I, have, I have it on GitLab. So now I can create like a branch from Xcode itself. Let me just create one quick branch. I'm just going to call it branch demo. And then the cool thing about like the new features is like if you have like something and then you make a change, you can go here to, to, to this section of, of the navigator, go to changes, and then here you can like see exactly what changed. And even you can compare it. And let, let me zoom here. You can like select like previous branches. You can see what has changed. Um, you can do like many things like we do with other tools, but now it's like embedded in Xcode. So in this case, I'm going to compare it with something else. In this case, I remove this os.log. I remove this as well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now so you can commit from here. And you can like, like submit a peer, uh, PR also from, from Xcode itself. And you can like also put some comments in the PR itself. You can see like the comments from like your, your teammates. 
Um, and again, like everything is kind of like focused now on, on Nextcode or everything is like now in Nextcode, which makes things a little bit easier and like it saves us some time. So here I'm going to create the pull request. Oops. I tried merging it, but like it doesn't work because maybe my beta doesn't work. But like if we go here, if we go to GitLab, I can see like my PRs. And then I can like put some comments again from Excel itself. And again, things are not working properly because it's a beta, but eventually they will be part of Xcode. So here, like if I want to merge also, it will give me an error. Um, so that's basically everything for version control. Again, like looking forward for like the new features. Um, some of, of, of the other new features that were introduced by um, Xcode are like the organizer. I mean, organizer is not new, but like they have the like new features for organizer. So like if you don't know what organizer is, it's like a tool to identify problems with our code. Um, so like the new things that were added uh, as part of Xcode 13 were like these regressions and some of like the um, easy termination uh, findings. So regressions, if, like if your app, whenever you uh, integrate with test flight, if, if a new version is not um, working properly, if it's like very slow and if, if it uses like more memory, it will trigger a regression. And one very, very cool feature that they added is kind of like um, instant reports of crashes. Again, if you are integrated with test flight, now it will tell you like in instant time, like all the crashes that you are getting, and it can also like point you to the code that causes those crashes, which is going to be very, very helpful. Um, also Xcode Cloud, which again, it's like a big, big topic, and it has like a lot of information. So I recommend going to like the docs was introduced. And it's focused on CI CD in parallel testing. It integrates like test flight directly into the cloud. And it's basically um, for like big features or big apps that kind of like need like this team environment. Another feature, which I also we are going to have a talk later by Joseph, is a, a DocC, which is a doc compiler, which basically it's like a tool to read like the markdown comments that like you uh, in your code. And it builds them into like the Xcode default help system. So then whenever like you want to see like the documentation, it's going to look exactly like the one that Apple, the other Apple frameworks looks like. And that's it. Thank you very much. And um, these are like some very useful sources. And like again, looking forward for like the new features, like in the next beta. And looking forward like to also to hear like all these other topics that we have today. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you very much. That's a lot. Um, just if anybody is wondering, we'll try to not try. We will share the slides uh, together in one folder as, along with the uh, with the recording. Um, well, it's just uh, ne next to the next topic, which is going to be about what's new and exciting in accessibility. Craig. Yes, sir. Start? All right. Um, let's see, make sure my, can you see my screen? I mean, my, uh, slides. Yep. All right, cool. All right. Well, let's, let's get into it. So my name is Craig. I am a iOS senior iOS engineer. I've been working, um, I've been doing iOS since 2010. Um, and the only reason I remember that is because I started the day it was announced for the new iPad. No one knew what an iPad was back then, and I was super excited to work on it. And now I don't get to work on it. So um, the, the this talk is basically going to kind of cover a little bit of um, accessibility, not just in iOS, but um, things they're doing in Watch and and some of the other stuff that's going on. And um, I know I'm super excited, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into it. So what am I gonna cover? First thing I'm going to do is talk about the accessibility panel. 
Um, you just heard a little bit about it, but I'm going to speak a little bit more on it. We're also going to talk about uh, charts and how they work with accessibility now. We're going to talk about rotor that has to do with the um, some some of you are familiar if you've done any accessibility before you've done stuff with rotor and that's not new but you'll see what uh, new stuff there are now. Um, and we'll also look into assistive touch so accessibility panel is the first thing that we're going to cover and. Um, we now have the ability to um, look at uh, interact with all of our elements within Swift UI and see a panel that will tell us whether or not there is an accessibility element um, has been added or a trait, a label, a value, an identifier. And this is huge because now we don't have to run our project to get it started. Now, um, if you've done accessibility in the past, you always had to run the app, then use this little accessibility thing that never worked, no offense to Apple, but it never worked. And so we basically had to do whatever we could to try to do deal with accessibility and if you had a project that took a while to run and then build and then go to that view and then look at the accessibility it took you all kinds of time to do it and now we'll be able to do it with interviews um this feature is kind of um you know it is in beta so if you try to use it it will not work and one other caveat is you need monterey in order to use this feature if you try to use it in uh catalina it won't work. You have to have Monterey OS. And I believe that's one of the only features. I haven't checked everything, but um, that one, it wouldn't work at all. So keep that in mind. Charts. So charts are something that are very difficult to do. They're very hard to do with accessibility. And they're very important for uh, sighted users. So they should be important to accessibility users and now apple's given us the ability to do charts and use um accessibility for them to go through everything so when you see charts we 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 uh, sighted users have the benefit of being able to see all the beautiful charts that people make in their apps um and a lot of this data is not really accessible or visible to them so Apple is now letting us use what's known as accessibility children. This will give us the ability to loop through every item that we have, give it a um, an accessibility label and a value. And as you can see here, it's not really hard to do. You're just going to loop through your array of items that you already are doing, most likely using in your Swift UI views. Um, you're just going to add another feature for here to you're going to use the same thing to show the labels and when you do that we're going back to the accessibility chart we'll be able to actually see every single element that's in the chart as well in the accessibility panel from before so again apple's given us the flexibility to be able to know exactly what we're getting what we're going to uh, add accessibility to and be able to see it and know when we need to add something like a trait. In this case, there are no traits, there's no identifiers, and we know that now, but we can see that values working and labels working. And that right there, again, is amazing for anyone that um, does accessibility. And if you don't, then you should, because it's important. Now, when you use accessibility and you're using, um, you'll be able to see how it uh, cycles through with voiceover. Um, and here it's showing it's going through budget history and then it's looping through every single item. So the user is going to be able to cycle through or they'll be able to use the rotor to skip budget history and move to the next um, title or header. And I'll explain that more in just a second. But this is what the user end user will see once they um, enable a uh, voiceover in their apps. Rotor. So as i said before rotor has been around for a very long time and most people probably have never heard of it or never used it and why is rotor important so rotor allows the allows the accessibility user to um cycle through different um headings and containers and they can really quickly get through your content so if you have no headers and all you have are accessibility items, then they have to literally go through every single item to get through 
to get through your content. And that can be tedious. Imagine having to hit the arrow button every time you want to get through something. That's what they're having to do. So you need to make sure you, you add traits and you add headers for your container so that the user can go from one to the other to the other if they're, if they're looking for some specific content. So the user can use their fingers to rotate and, and uh, cycle through these um, using Rotor. And that's how they access it now. So when they use Rotor, if they wanted to jump to headers, they could literally use Rotor and say headers. And then they go from friends to budget history to uh, two unread alerts. This gives them the ability to say they don't care about friends, they don't care about budget, but they want to know about alerts. And then on the alerts, if you notice, we have some important alerts that are in here. And for them, they'd have to cycle through all of the alerts to find the ones that are the important alerts. And that's not really effective or useful for them. And again, rotors are not new, but now Apple's giving us custom rotors. And here's how this works. So right now you see in the screen that we have two unread alerts and we have a regular alert. We have a regular alert and, and a one that has a warning. And the one that the, we wanna take the warnings and we want them to be able to access those immediately, not have to go through every single one to find them. So now we can do an accessibility rotor for warnings alone in iOS 15. And now the, uh, now the end user, once they get to, um, to our alert section, they're gonna be able to get all the warnings first without having to go through the data. And this is huge because again, they don't have to go through the data to do this. Now, assistive touch is probably one of the most uh, dopest features I've seen. And I literally tr like flipped out when I saw it. So in watchOS 15, we have now what's called assistive touch. And how does assistive touch work? Well, you can now interact with elements for end users who for users who only have one arm and cannot use their other arm. So as you see in the video, this user, the, the demo is showing you she's um, doing a clinch to tap on elements. She's using a double clinch to open up the action menu. She's pinching to go to the next element within the item, and she's double pinching to go to the previous item. So right there alone, they're giving the ability for, for accessibility users who only have one arm and that they can access anything on their watch just by clinching and double, by pinching and clinching, which is insane. But that's not all Apple did. They, they added assistive touch, but they also added dwell control. So as you can see here, the user can take their wrist and rotate and use the little um, use a little pointer on screen to select something that they want or on that they're trying to tap onto. So they they literally given the user the ability to not ever touch their screen on their watch and access the information. Again, this right here to me is just mind blowing. I, I know everyone's all excited about async, but this right here is just insane, insane, man. So what does assistive touch get, give the users to do? It gives them full use of the Apple Watch without ever touching the device. It's controlled by hand gestures or hand motions. Its access to functionality is based on screen content. And they also have dwell control, which allows them to rotate, as, as I mentioned above, that allows them to use hand motions to control their um, watch. There are tons and tons of videos from WWDC 21 that you can check out. I've only touched a little bit of the of the features, but we now have they have Swift UI accessibility beyond the basics, accessibility by design, developer spotlight accessibility. Um, they're bringing accessibility to charts and they're telling tailoring the voiceover experience and enriched data apps. All five videos are 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 great. One thing that um, I didn't bring up but they, they have a video on is the developer spotlight accessibility. And that goes into detail about Xcode and developers who have disabilities using Xcode and being developers. So if you know someone or if you've ever been interested, that is a video to check out if you didn't see it in there.
And also, please go back. Dub Dub 20 has a lot of uh, great videos on accessibility, and they reference a lot of them in those videos. So really quickly, what, what did we cover today? Uh, we looked at the new accessibility panel that's only featured in, in Monterey OS. We looked at how you can now um, add accessibility to charts and individual bars in your charts. We looked at the rotor and the new feature of being able to do custom rotors. And then finally, we, we, we looked at assistive touch and how that is going to is a game changer for anyone that uh, can't actually touch their watch. Now they have the ability to fully control their watch without ever having to touch it. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Um, again, what's exciting and new in accessibility for iOS, X, um, iOS, Mac OS, and watch OS, not just iOS 15. And I appreciate your, your time. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A today because we have so many speakers. But like I said before, we'll have a networking session at the end, so keep your questions. And if uh, the speakers cannot make it all the way, we'll figure out a way to share their information with you. Um, and without further ado, and Craig, by the way, love the light and the microphones. Really, really good sound. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, passing it to Joanna, who is going to talk to us about a nice grand packet to make over Swift your core data. Give it to you. Thank you. All right. Well, I think some of us, including myself, were hoping for maybe a new persistence framework to be announced this year. But um, what we got instead was a little makeover for our old grandpa core data, which has been around for over 16 years. It's a solid persistence framework, and we got a few nice additions this year. Um, my name is Johannes, and I've been working with Apple Technologies since 2007, with iOS since two, 2008, originally from Germany. I lived in Brooklyn for a while, and now I live in Arizona. So now let's get right into four new things that we want to cover. And we'll use Apple's Earthquakes sample app uh, to guide us through some of these changes and updates. And the first one is dynamic configuration. So if you've used core data with Swift UI in the past and you wanted to, uh, for example, use sort descriptors to change the sort order of items in a list or you wanted to filter using predicates that was difficult to do. You kind of had to set up your sort descriptors and predicates ahead of time, pass them into your Swift UI view, uh, into the initializer, and then that was it. If you wanted to change them, you entered a world of pain. No more. Now we have dynamic configuration. And when we create a fetch request, we see, of course, we can pass in initial sort descriptors. We even got a new sort descriptor value type that makes this a little bit more concise. And if we want to change them, we simply change them. So now we have a property on our fetch request that we can simply update. And if we do so, uh, our Swift UI views update as a result. The same is true for NS predicate. We now also have a property for NS predicate that we can dynamically update. And in connection with the searchable view modifier, this makes for a very easy addition to filter a list of items using core data. And in the earthquake sample app, that looked like this. So it was very easy to add this with the NS predicate and um, add filtering to search results. The next thing that's new is sectioned fetching. So what we get now is something that's similar to NS fetched results controller that we might have used before in core data. And this is what it looks like. So instead of using a fetch request, we can use a sectioned fetch request. And that has a section identifier that tells us how we want to group the results that we get back from our core data query. And in that case, in this case, we want to group our earthquakes by day. And then instead of iterating over the actual earthquakes, over the actual core data entities that we get back, we iterate over the sections. And then within each section, we iterate over the earthquakes in that section. 
And what does that look like in the UI? Well, we get nice collapsible sections for free in Swift UI. The third change is of course, async await support was added to core data. And we just wanna to touch on this briefly. I think this might've been the most important slide in that uh, WWDC talk. The perform and await and perform methods now have async await counterparts that we can use. And the nice thing is they make uh, returning of values and also uh, error handling a lot more elegant than it was before. It was a little clunky to do that before in these blocks. The fourth area we want to look at is spotlight indexing. And this is not particularly new, uh, but it kind of came to my attention uh, in this year's WWDC. And it's a really cool feature. It's so easy to expose your core data, data to spotlight search. And in the Earthquakes app, all, all you had to do is open your core data model. And this model only has one entity, Quake, and set the display name for Spotlight. And in this case, we want the place to be the display name that shows up in Spotlight search results. Step two is selecting that place attribute and checking the index and Spotlight checkbox. And then you need to add just two lines of code that's initializing an NS core data core spotlight delegate. And this is one change in iOS 15. So the four store with model initializer is deprecated and the four store with coordinator uh, initializer is now the new default. And when using that initializer, we need to call start spotlight indexing. And there's no step four. So when you do that and you start the app, right away you can search for places and the earthquakes show up right in spotlight and the index is updated automatically and in ios 15 we got another nice change that deleting the spotlight index is now also a lot easier than it was before and that's it that's all we had time for of course there's a lot more changes and core data as a whole got uh, a nice update on some APIs that are swiftier to use, more elegant to use, and also integration with CloudKit, especially when it comes to sharing, has become a lot easier in iOS 15. Thank you very much. Awesome presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I, I, will, I will just pass it to the next speaker, who is Stefan. He's going to talk to us about attributed string and the new Markdown support. Yep. Thanks, Paul. So share my screen, which you should be seeing right now, I believe. Um, OK, so yes, I wanted to do a very quick talk about the new improvements that uh, Apple brought us to attribute string and the markdown support. Uh, so first of all, yeah, I'm going to uh, present myself. So I've been uh, developing for iOS for over nine years now, um, working at agencies, working in a lot of projects, and uh, always excited about new development in WWDC. And so I'm going to talk about one of them in particular today, uh, the attribute string uh, new value type. So if uh, you look at this, so uh, there is this new uh, value type that complements uh, the existing NS attribute string uh, that existed for a lot of years. Um, and it's now a pure Swift type. Uh, that has all of the value semantics, so like we are used to uh, with the string. Um, the API is much more easy, like easier to use. Um, it also adds markdown support. Uh, even if it's a light, it can be extended, which I'm going to talk about afterwards. Um, and uh, yeah, it allows for uh, easy styling in your strings and uh, easy localization of that style as well. Um, through uh, like customization points, like custom attributes. Um, so first of all, I wanted to cover that uh, those, uh, the, the new attribute string and the old one, they can be uh, used one and the other inter interchangeably 
uh, interchangeably uh, very easily. Uh, they have a new constructor, each of them, that can just take one or the other, uh, making it easy to like use it in UI kits, and, like for UI label, for example. Um, so the base API is kind of similar to what we're used to, uh, except that um, it uses uh, a new feature in Swift for 5.3, I believe, uh, called dynamic member lookup to make it uh, a very easy experience. So we uh, all we have to do is like define a, a text and then an attribute container, which uh, you will say which attributes you want to set directly. So if you want to say a title form, for example, to uh, your text, you can just do uh, in the context of SwiftUI, SwiftUI.font equal title. Uh, and similarly for the changing the uh, foreground color. And you see the result on the right, uh, what it looks like. Um, so this new type specifically adds uh, markdown support. Uh, so uh, we've all probably used markdown. It's everywhere now. Uh, and it allows for easy styling that's uh, basic. Uh, so we can do bold, you can do italic, you can do strike through. You can do uh, links, images, um, and uh, as you can see, it's basically the syntax we're all used to. Uh, so it becomes very easy to know how inline uh, attributes uh, and define those easily without having to clutter with code. Um, so this allows for much easier localization of uh, uh, like styled text. Uh, whereas in the past, we had to get uh, like the range of the text we need to localize, add attributes to it. Now, thanks to Markdown, we can just uh, localize the Markdown string directly and have the reference in the Swift UI, and it would just pick it up um, as it is translated uh, without having to do uh, more work. Um, on top of that, uh, you can add custom attributes to the strings. Um, so giving a quick example uh, that was in the, the, the uh, DC uh, uh, video, uh, like adding a rainbow attribute, where uh, you just specify your new rainbow attribute, uh, including your new attributes uh, for your app. And it would just uh, display as that in your markdown. Uh, the attributes can take anything from uh, like that is codable in JSON. And so you can uh, like have pretty powerful use cases uh, for custom attributes uh, for your app. Um, so um, to conclude this very quick talk, uh, I think that yeah, the new attribute string uh, API is gonna uh, make it our lives much easier. Uh, as the API is much easier to use and allows for localization in a very easy way. Uh, and uh, it also, it's so I only showed a few examples, but it's available thanks to NS Attributed Spring on all uh, like platforms you could think of. Um, and more resources. So uh, there is uh, one video uh, that talks about it. And unfortunately, they haven't released a sample yet for that video, but I hope they do release it uh, soon. Um, what have you? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, yeah, just a quick reminder. Again, we cannot do Q&A, but if you have any questions, feel free to always use the chat. That's the best way you have right now, and we'll have networking at the end. Um, I'm going to pass it to Sorry, last track. Swift, uh, Florian, who is going to talk to us about Swift package collections. Give me one second. I'm trying to share my screen. Um, well, I just restarted Zoom because it was lacking permissions, but apparently it's still lacking permissions. So I need to restart Slack uh, Zoom once again. If you want, we can, uh, we can switch maybe if the next speaker is ready. Do you need uh, more time? 
Uh, give me one second, or you can switch and, and I'll try, but it's just pretty started. Um, give you 30 right. seconds. All right. I don't know if you're ready, Jay, you tell us, otherwise we can just wait. I'll try it again, one second. Um, I, I could go ahead if you want me to. Um, it's up to you. Let's give him another minute and depending on sure. how he restarts. All right, if we're still good, I'm going to share. Yeah. All right. All right. The second time was the charm. Like I made sure to prepare, but apparently that wasn't it. All right, so um, here's my talks with package collections. My name is Florian Hart. I am the IS lead um, at the Wall Street Journal and I've been developing for IS for 10, 11 years, something like that now. Um, I've known Josef for a while, so he asked me to speak. Um, I've met him several times at 360 IDEF, which is, by the way, an excellent uh, conference that I'm going to speak at this year again. So you all should visit, um, or at least online in some kind of form. But let's talk about it, uh, today's topics with package collections, what it is, and um, what you can do with Swift package collections. So as a small overview, um, Swift package collections is essentially a JSON file representing a collection of packages. A big surprise there, I'm sure because um, nobody could have judged from the name that it's a collection of packages. Um, mostly a JSON file contains offer metadata and version compatibility that is parsed from the package source. What's that, what does that mean? So essentially I'm going to show you in a second um, what the generation looks like and what the actual schema looks like. But what Apple did is essentially they, they gave you a way to put together to, to easily put in several packages in form of like the source where it's coming from and then they parse all kinds of metadata. So that also means that they have to actually um, scrape GitHub in, um, to get all the metadata like keywords and stuff like that, which we're going to look at in a second. Um, and so you also have to add like a token for the, or a GitHub token so that it can fetch all the metadata from it. Um, Xcode 13 includes a default collection that includes Swift algorithms and Swift collections, which I'm going to show in a second. Conveniently, Apple put that in as a default collection. So um, it, it might be Apple's own product, but it's still a little bit interesting that they have a, a generally trusted collection added into Xcode 13 as a standard. And optionally, you can sign collections for security and trust. Um, there is a asterisk in there um, showing that there might be something there. We'll talk about it in a second. So what does, Swift, uh, what does Swift package collections look like? So if you open up Xcode 13 in the beta and then you go from the file menu and add a package, this is your um, new kind of like way of adding a package. Both the collections are in here as well as like the original Swift package that you were like pointing towards a package that Swift file is now basically consolidated into this one screen. It shows you on the left side, your, your collections that you might have in the bottom left, you have a plus, a minus, and a refresh button. Plus essentially gives you the option to either point it at, towards a package that's Swift or towards an absolute path. That would be the collection that's chasing. And then whenever your collection is in there, and we're going to see like how a sample collection looks like in a second, your packages that are within the collection are going to show up in the center of the, the screen. You can also even point it towards a local collection. Um, so you wouldn't have to go for the trust thing that I've been just talking about. And then you have essentially the readme from GitHub. Um, I think it works with several Git providers and you could even use it with like a, a custom Git provider that isn't as, as sophisticated as GitHub where you have the readme and all. Um, so you could like completely forego that. You would just be missing the stars and, and some of the metadata that we've been talking about. Um, I've created a, a um, sample collection, the DCIS test collection for this meetup here, essentially, uh, that I'm, I'm, I linked to in, the document, uh, in this presentation that you can all try if you wanted to. I wasn't able to sign it. Um, we're going to talk about it in a second. That's why you're seeing if you're trying to add a collection and hasn't been signed by a, a public trust authority with a code signing certificate, so different from the code signing certificate that you might have used to sign your um, your apps from the App Store, you're getting this warning that's saying basically, oh, package collection is not signed. Um, I couldn't find like a certificate that, that has been trusted and you need to agree to add the collection despite eventually um, the, trust, the trust clause that you're going in. 
And then when the collection is added, this is what it looks like, right? That's your, your coming from the metadata, the little Ceph icon essentially is being parsed um, from your metadata. And in my case, you have this little red X that the collection is being added. There's one caveat to it, but I, I've, um, while doing this presentation tested is we've talked about a refresh button and there's a version to each one of the um, package collections that you have. If it's untrusted, it's not refreshing. I've tried it with, with, a, um, with a trusted one, right? So if the collection actually changes and you have a trusted one, it will automatically update it. But in the case of a untrusted one, even if you're manually clicking it, it will not update the collection for you and will not show it. You will see the gist that I ordered, the GitHub um, gist that I put in here, right? Um, has now three packages instead of the two that you're seeing. This was when I initially added it and then clicked, ref and then I added the third one, refreshed it several times, and it only works if you're like removing it, adding it. So the, the trust thing is a little bit tricky here. What does the structure look like? So from a step-by-step a -step perspective is Apple has a set of tools that I'm going to talk about or that I've linked at the end. Um, that is essentially a Swift package itself, gives you three binaries, one to generate, one to sign, and one to verify your collections. And so what they're doing is essentially that you, you have to write the structure yourself. So you have to write the first initial structure that gives the metadata about name, overview, keywords, offer, and the, the, the offer's name, as well as the packages that you want to add into the initial structure then you are compiling their tools, the Swift package collection generator. And this is essentially, I've, I've linked it here, but essentially you're inputting your JSON file, the one that we just shown, you put in, you're saying like what your collection, the file name for the output file looks like, you're adding your GitHub off token to it so that it can actually go against GitHub and fetch these repositories. That generates this, um, this collection that I've, I've put underneath this link that we've just seen and that becomes this relatively huge blob um, that you can all look at the screen at uh, this this um, GitHub link that I put there. I initially put it in there, but it ends up being eight eight hundred lines of uh, JSON essentially, with all the version compatibilities and all in the format that you needed to. You can literally host it anywhere, right? So it, it can be like I had it on GitHub. It can be on a file server. There's no restriction against HTTP or HTTPS. To, um, I've tried it in both secured and insecured. So that has a little bit of a taste to it, um, which is very uncommon for Apple with all the ATS stuff they've been doing. But um, you, you actually get a warning for HTTP. So there's at least that. You can sign with code signing certificate with uh, public private key pairs. So I assume any kind of like, um, or not assume, like what I've been showing, and this is undocumented. All the free tools that I've mentioned, they only actually ever talk about the two, which is verification and the generation, but not the signing tool. So the signing tool, you actually need to use the, the help and you see from the GitHub repository um, that the signing tool was added last. So I, I assume that's gonna come some more documentation on the parameters and whatnot. Um, but I couldn't sign it with the with my IIS signing certificates. So I've tried it with the um, Let's Encrypt HTTPS certificates that I had. Um, that looked better, but I, I didn't actually end up finishing um, signing it. The private key pair was not accepted. It was in, the, in an unacceptable format. So I'm curious what kind of format they were needing to actually sign it. But then essentially the, the public key is going to be embedded in the JSON structure that you've seen, which gives you the, the trust chain that you need. Um, yep, and it has an easy access in the Xcode menu. These are the references I've used. There's an interesting video about it. It's only 15 minutes if you ever want to look at it. That's a sample collection that I've showed you. And the Swift package index, for those of you who know it, starts to like, it's actually going to that route of like integrating more and more collections. They have a Vapor collections for the Swift server side tools, for example. Um, their packages are also unsigned at this point, which I believe has, is a part of what I've been talking about. And if we want to look at it real quick, um, I still think I'm uh, dropped the desktop. That was the wrong button. Um, and if we look real quick at it, that's the menu I've been talking about. If you're going to file add packages, it gives you these um, two collections that you have. And very similar to what you've been doing so far, if you've been using Swift packages, is if you're adding a package, it's fetching the metadata and it's fetching the part of the package. So it does a shallow clone at this point um, and then gives you an option to add it to your um, different targets that you have in here. 
and also the, all the, the packages that are essentially on the way to the package that you need. Yep, now you can select the product that you wanted from the package and the target. So this is very similar to what you've had before, except that you have it now in a collection that could potentially be trusted. I think one of the biggest use cases here is that if you're working for a larger company that wants to curate packages that they feel are within compliance, then they could potentially have a collection for you already that is being um, like within your company policy. All right, thanks for everybody's time. That's my talk. All right, awesome, thank you very much. I saw so many questions, but I'm not allowed. I have to go by the rules. <laughs> Hopefully be there for the next, uh, at the end. Um, all right, I'm gonna pass it to Jay, who is gonna talk to us about iCloud Private Relay. Hi, um, so to give a little introduction, uh, my name is Jay Tamboli. I have been working for Capital One for uh, almost seven years now, working on the, the same flagship app that, that Victor was talking about. Um, I work on a, a team called Firewatch. We focus on security. Um, and so of course I'm interested in you know, anything involving cryptography and things like that. And uh, Private Relay was something that really caught my eye both as a, a customer and as a developer. Um, so to start off, uh, Apple's been very emphatic in saying that uh, it's not a VPN, um, although it really does the same things that most people think of VPNs doing. Uh, the key differences that Apple points out are that there's this uh, two layer structure and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that more in a second, but uh, when your phone makes a connection, uh, it first connects to the ingress proxy. Ingress proxy then connects to the egress proxy and that connects to whatever your final destination site is. Um, but that means that because there are those two hops, it's different from a, a normal one hop VPN. Uh, secondly, you know, when you work for a big company or something like that, you have a VPN, it not only allows you to access resources that are on the private network, but uh, it's a bi-directional thing. People can access uh, your computer, you could host services, things like that. And um, this is not doing anything like that. So they've, they've said it's not a VPN, it's more like a proxy. Um, but uh, this gives you a, kind of an outline with, with how it works. From a user perspective, uh, they've done some really interesting things with this. Uh, first of all, it is enabled by default for everyone who has a paid iCloud account, which they're now calling iCloud Plus. Um, and in fact, they have this uh, kind of scary warning if you try to turn it off, saying that uh, you know that uh, anybody you connect to will be able to monitor your traffic and see what you're doing. You won't be protected. Um, and you know the the turn off is in bright red, telling you uh, trying to discourage people from doing that. Um, when it is enabled, all of your DNS lookups and Safari browsing traffic are going to go over the uh, iCloud private relay network. Um, it also includes um, any SF Safari view controllers inside apps. Um, they also, I, I saw this mentioned briefly, the, if your web browser Safari connects to a, a tracker that Apple is aware of, they have a, a list they maintain, uh, that will be routed over its connection, even if you have a free iCloud account. So they're doing that to protect privacy, um, even for free users. Right now, any traffic uh, that, that comes from an iOS, iOS app on a port 80, unencrypted HTTP, will go over the private relay, uh, but anything that is TCP port 443, so that's HTTPS, uh, that will be a direct connection. Um, uh, what I say here is that, uh, that I don't think there's really a principled reason that they treat those two differently. And um, you know, this is pure speculation on my part. I tried to, to go to a lab session and, and dig out some details on this, but they're, they're very tight-lipped. But I would expect that all apps, uh, you know, or at least uh, you know, port 443 traffic would be sent over this network in the future. Um, the way that they phrased it when I asked about it, I actually asked if uh, it's possible for an app to choose to send their traffic over the network. And the response was um, that uh, it is the user's choice whether traffic goes over iCloud private relay, uh, which means to me that that they don't want apps to have any decision in the matter that it's gonna be up to the user. And I think it's therefore, you know, a good chance Apple will opt into that uh, and, and make that an option as well. Uh, maybe next year before we see that but we don't know. In terms of the privacy protection for users, um, there, are, there are kind of four servers involved in a connection. 
the first thing that your device will talk to is the private relay access token server. Um, and this is just your, your phone or whatever will authenticate using your iCloud credentials and the server provides some tokens. Um, those tokens are not tied to your account and uh, they do some, some cryptography stuff to uh, prevent those being tied back to your account. And so when your phone then wants to make a connection um, you know, out to something on the web, your phone first goes to the ingress proxy and gives it one of these tokens. The ingress proxy can decrypt what you send to that ingress proxy. And from that, it, the only thing it knows is it knows your IP address. It knows where the connection is coming from. It knows that you've got a valid token and it knows the egress proxy that your device has chosen. So it doesn't know who you are and doesn't know uh, what your final destination is, what you're trying to look at. Uh, that proxy forwards to the egress proxy who then can decrypt another layer and they can see the final destination, the IP address you're trying to connect to, but they only see that this information came from the ingress proxy. They can't see farther back and they don't know who, they, who you are either. Uh, and then finally, the destination server, the website or you're, you're trying to connect to, um, they see the connection coming from the egress server. So they don't know, again, don't know who you are uh, unless you log in, you know, you tell them who you are uh, and they know your general geographical location. So the way Apple set this up is they, they've said that uh, this is not for, um, you know, choosing different locations. So it's not like some VPN services where I could choose to have my connection come from California or I don't know, Greece or Brazil uh, to test out things from different parts of the country. It's really designed uh, for privacy. And so Apple keeps it in the same jurisdiction and time zone. Um, in my testing, and this is on an iPad that's a few years old, so it's not the fastest processor. Uh, I saw from fast.com, I was getting 110 megabits per second, both with and without um, the, uh, the private relay, the, you know, this is something new, it's beta one. I expect the performance will continue to improve, but at least, you know, right now it, it's transparent to me. Uh, from a provider perspective, um, biggest note is it's turned on for everybody. So there will be a lot of traffic coming through this. And that means that you probably don't want to treat the traffic all that differently because a lot of customers are going to be using it. Uh, Apple did say they will publish a list of the egress IP addresses. And so far I've seen uh, Akamai, Cloudflare, Fastly IPs. Um, but Apple has really said that the way their process is set up, you shouldn't treat it differently. They said that their token process, uh, quote, ha it has strong authentication tied to the hardware. So they're, they're doing some crypto stuff to prove that it is a, a real Apple device with this traffic's originating, not an emulator, not a, a server somewhere. Um, but because of their multi-hop process, there's not any way to report abuse. Or if you did report abuse to Apple, there's no way they could attribute that back to a specific user. And that's, that's by design. Um, they do have systems to try to prevent denial of service attacks, things like that, they said. But um, you know, it's not really clear how much they're going to be able to uh, to stop particular users who are abusing the system, uh, maybe just stop particular connections. Um, there's a great video, uh, Apple's Privacy Pillars in Focus, that I, I would recommend to everyone. It talks about this in a little bit more detail. Um, and uh, you know, personally, I'm looking forward to this both as a as a customer and uh, you know as as somebody who works on the server because it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Sorry, I was not ready. That was it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, it was pretty short, but uh, right. No, it was around. great. It was a lot of information, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much for putting it together. And definitely, like very advanced topic. That's awesome. Um, um, all right. Now for the, I guess the topic that everybody's been talking about, I think the weight, one of one flavor of it, I guess. Uh, and, and by the way, thank you very much for everybody who actually uh, signed up for that topic and uh, submitted a talk about async await and had to change so we don't have too many of these. Uh, but definitely, there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, I will pass it to uh, Wendy to talk about uh, her take on uh, async await versus GCD. Can you all uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay. okay. Hi. Um, so let me 
behind my shitty note first. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Wenji. Uh, I'm the senior iOS developer in Compass. And today I want to chat a little bit about the Swift brand new feature, async await, the difference between it and the GCD and why it, how async it is better. So first of all, let's, uh, I want to recap a little bit about the concept of async and await in Swift. So what it is, um, async and await is this new feature in Swift 5.5 that's only available on iOS 15. Um, that is supposed to make writing asynchronous code easier, simpler, safer, and more readable. So let's see, how are we going, how are we handling asynchronous code in a function right now? One of the most common cases is use completion handler, especially in handling network call. Here is uh, one simple common case. Uh, we, want, we want to download some image and then get a thumbnail from those downloaded image. So first of all, we fetch the image from the URL set with the URL session method. Then in the completion handler, we handle all different kind of error cases and then a success case, getting the image. Then we call the prepare thumbnail method, which is another asynchronous call, uh, has another completion handler. Then in this nested completion handler, we repeat the same of handling error and success case. So, so um, it's pretty straightforward. We probably everyone had been with it. What's bad about it? The downside of completion handler, the first of all is it doesn't allow you to use try and catch. Um, with try and catch, Swift ensure that if a value isn't returned, an error is thrown. We cannot use it in completion, uh, in, com in completion handler. So it's up to us to make sure we return error or a value in all possible cases. It can get really complicated and hard to track. And, and sometimes we just forgot some of the edge cases we're supposed to handle. Also, that usually comes with many lines of code and not really elegant, uh, especially with that many nested brackets. It's also hard to read and follow, even though the logic is very simple. And with all above, it's very easy to introduce bugs. So if I want to write the same function, how would it look like with async and, async and await? So here, let's see. We, the, for the two asynchronous operation, now they are marked as await here. When the awaitable, for, for the first one, when the awaitable data method is called, it suspends itself quickly, where I try to mark with the dash line. That's where the function basically paused there, but the thread is still running. Um, and then until the US URL session method returns a method, then it continue to go down to the next line to handle the response and the error, et cetera. Um, download, get parts in the image. Then the same thing happened again for the second away. It suspends itself. And then until it returns, then it just return, continue to return the thumbnail. So we already see some benefit here. We are taking advantage of the try and catch right here for the uh, URL session method. So it's already safer and cleaner. And it's shorter, simpler, also easier to read and understand. Okay, we already see it has a nicer syntax. So what's the difference under the hood for async and await? Let's first see how GCD works under the hood. Um, let's assume a case of device have two CPU core, A and B. And each of this blue stripe means it's a threat. With a Assuming a case with that, we have a table view showing different images. So we are trying to prefetch many image and showing the some thumbnail at the same time. So um, as you can see, the network concurrent threat uh, queue will first spin up two threads um, to download the image. And as soon as the threat one being blocked, it will spin up another thread, the threat three. And then once the threat three get blocked, it will spin another threat, threat four so on and so forth. So uh, when there is a threat get blocked, GCD concurrent queue just spin up another one. That's how the concurrent queue work. As the test goes on, there are more threats here. As you can see, like in this specific case, it has eight threats exist. And while we only have two cores, that leads to a threat explosion. We have way more threats than the core, number of cores. Um, and that's one thing. And secondly, let's look at the blocked threats. 
we have a lot of threads waiting in memory. And each of these broad threads takes a lot of memory space. It contains the stack, the kernel data structure, and other environment variables, and other environment variables other than the code we're going to run. So moreover, core has to do a full threat context switching. As like we can see in the CP uh, in the core A, we need to go from threat one to threat three to threat four, and later when the threat comes back, we need to like switch again. And those full context switch are very expensive and that bring down CPU efficiency. Okay, so how does Swift new feature approach the same issue? First of all, we can see um, for the same case, there's only two threads, one in the CPU A and one in CPU B. So already this the feature will need to make make sure the number of threads will never more than the number of cores. So we will never have to do the full threat context switching. And then instead of using spin up different threads, Swift has a lightweight object known as continuation to track the uh, resumption, the resumption of the work. So you can see um, all this continuation, basically a block of code that's run inside the thread. And for con each continuation, it only stores the code after the wait function, which if we look at back the look back at the code, it's what after the dash line. So that's the only part the continuation st store. So it's much lightweight and have much smaller memory footprint than threads. This also means instead of switching different thread, we only pay the cost of switching methods when we go from continuation A to three to four, et cetera. And to make it even more efficient, this new brand new Swift new feature make it um, make it create this uh, runtime protocol. So for each async method, it will have a continuation. So we know what's next. And at the same time, for all this async work, it is modeled with tasks. So a parent task can will only finish when all its child tasks are completed. So with this runtime protocol. For each thread, we can always make sure in making forward progress process, um, which just GCD we we don't have this for each block for each block thread. It just have to wait for it to unblock or wait for the signal to come back to continue run. It does not know what is forward. So let's take a look again. Take away for all the improvement ASIN and the way it has for GCDQ. Uh, it can easy to have threat explosion while async and await. Make sure the threat number is always less or equal than the core number. Also, in each threat, it has a very heavy memory usage. While the new lightweight continuation uh, is much more friendly for memory usage. For the GCDQ, every we not using the CPU very efficiently because we need to do the full thread contest switching, um, while in the ASIN way, it just suddenly becomes a light function switching in the same thread. And at the end, it's hard to track between threads in GCDQ and uh, in ASIN way, the runtime contract to make sure the thread always moving forward. Um, so my conclusion is basically um, the new ASIN in the way not only improve the readability of the code, but also the efficiency of core execution and also the performance of the app. Um, I highly support using ASIN the way for new code, if you have a chance. That's all, thank you. Wow, that was awesome. Such an interesting take on the topic. Thank you very much. Love the explanation as well, super clear. Um, thank you. Before we move to the next topic, as you remember, maybe at the beginning, we talked about a raffle. So the idea <clears throat> before we go to, we have two talks left uh, before we get there. So I have time to basically pick the winners. Uh, I wanted to share the link to the um, sign up form for the raffle right now. So everybody gets a chance to put their name in there. And then at the very end, during the announcements, I will well, announce who are the winners. So you can look in the chat. Um, there will be a link. All right. This is a Google form. So as a reminder, actually, I'm going to share my screen very quickly for the reminder. 
Um, as a reminder, the raffle today, uh, which is something we never do, by the way, for those of you who are here for the first time, this is a very unique situation where we have great, great prizes today. So hopefully you will enjoy it. We're gonna have 12 winners, two tickets for 360 iDev. You'll see in the form when we get there that you don't have to sign up for it. If for whatever reason those days don't work for you, you don't want to go in person or you don't want to attend online, again, this is an option. You can attend from home. Uh, then please select no so people who are interested can get a chance to win it. This is the highest uh, priced value, I guess, uh, price. Then two people will win a hundred dollar gift card, um, Apple gift card, and eight other people will get a twenty-five dollars. Obviously, the speakers today are more than welcome and encouraged to participate as well. Uh, the way it works again, put your name in there. And at the end of the last two presentations, uh, we'll announce the winners. The last time, we actually, we, we had a raffle one more time, which was last meetup in May. And we had this wheel of fortune, and it didn't work very well. So here today, what I'm going to do is instead, so you know the transparency of the process, uh, I'm going to use a random number generator, and I'm going to pick names out of the list. And I'm going to announce the list out of nowhere, seemingly, but actually it's going to be coming from, from that. So, so, the, so, 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 you know, um, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, so again, I give you until the end of the next presentation to put in your name. So about five minutes. And after that, I will close down the, the form and, uh, and start picking the names. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat. And without further ado, while I do that, I will pass it to uh, BJ, who is going to talk to us about uh, Xcode. Sorry, I don't know, I said it anymore. Binding, VIM bindings in Xcode 13, right? Yes, indeed. Here, let me share my screen. Yeah, and BJ, just want to give a quick shout out. I still have your book here, second edition, Xcode 7, <laughs> Swift 2.0. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, back, back then. <laughs> And it has not been updated since. So, uh, yeah, that was that was quite an experience. You already hit perfection, so no need to update. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, let's see. Um, well, uh, if you if you haven't guessed, uh, part of my background is that uh, um, I wrote one of the first books on the Swift programming language called "Teach Yourself Swift in Twenty Four Hours." Um, Thank you for the reminder. I'd kind of blacked that part of my life out for a second. No, you're famous. Uh, so, what's that? So you're famous for it. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I guess my mom thought I was cool, so that was good. <laughs> um, no, so my my name is B.J. Miller. Uh, I'm from the Cleveland, Ohio area, and uh, co-run the Cocoa Heads there with Daniel Steinberg. Uh, it's a good time there. So thank you for inviting me to join you guys here. Uh, and this was. Uh, this has been a great meetup so far. Thanks to everyone who's spoken so far and who will be speaking. Um, and I almost feel bad because there have been so many good talks and mine is purely an anger fueled uh, rage about how Xcode has lacked BIM key bindings for so long and something so trivial to so many people. Uh, but I complained about it incessantly at every single Cocoa Heads to the point where it became a joke where I threatened people to say like, if, if we don't have any presentations next month, then I'll just gripe about Xcode's lack of BIM key bindings. And now we have them. And so now I seemingly have nothing to complain about, but I will still find something to complain about. So uh, anyways, uh, a little bit more background on me. I'm the senior iOS engineer at uh, Skiplist. It's a small consultancy in Ohio. Uh, and uh, you know we, we create custom applications for companies, but we also have a few in-house projects that we're working on as well. So um, pretty cool. So uh, I will get on with the show here. So uh, if anybody's not familiar with VIM, um, it is, uh, VIM stands for VI Improved uh, with roots uh, going back to 1976's EX editor. Uh, so it's, it, it was before GUIs, before my, uh, mouse uh, intervention, it was all keyboard-based navigation. And so essentially it's got, you know, the mouseless text uh, editing. Uh, in fact, there were no really, I mean, there was a, there was a cursor that you would move around the screen, but there wasn't really a mouse cursor, what we think of today. Um, it uses something called modal navigation, which uh, by default, you are in what's called normal mode and you can navigate around the screen using H, J, K, L keys, uh, B for going back a word, W for going forward a word, E to go to the end of the word, et cetera. 
Um, and then you could you could enter into something called insert mode, which would allow you to type any character you want, use the arrow keys to go up and down, left, right. Uh, and then there's also visual modes. If you need to like select blocks of text, you can select them visually. Uh, it's it's very similar in concept if anybody's used like Emacs key bindings, which by default Xcode has. Uh, so things like Command U, or I'm sorry, Control U, uh, con Control I think is the biggest modifier key with Emacs key bindings. I don't use it a whole lot, so I can't speak to it. Um, and I know that the Emacs Vim key bindings wars are a lot like tabs and spaces or like Biggie and Tupac, you know, East Coast West Coast stuff. Uh, so if if you're familiar with key bindings in Xcode already. Feel free to use those. I'm just, I've been using Vim for 20 years. And so it's very natural to me. And so I hated that Xcode didn't have it. Uh, it is the default editor for some Unix and Linux tools, uh, especially Git. So if you've ever from the command line, if you've typed in, uh, you know, Git commit, uh, it, and it comes up with an editor, you have to type, you know, I to insert or shift O to create a new line above you if you're particular about spacing in your Git commits. Uh, and then the trick is figuring out how to get out of them uh, with the uh, colon WQ or colon X as a shortcut. Uh, some of the benefit is, and why is this important, is it can now be, it gives you more focus inside of Xcode. Uh, so you don't need to have the mouse as much as you uh, may have needed before uh, with, you know, jumping to different lines, uh, deleting a block of code, you know, going to, you know, if you're on the opening cursor and you want to go to the ending cursor, you can hit the percent key to do that, that kind of thing. So. Lots of cool functionality that's been added. Um, and it's also important because I can finally stop complaining about it. Uh, but that remains to be seen. So uh, like I said before, we've got insert and normal modes. Uh, and to do that, you uh, to get into insert mode, you've got your typical you know, I, A, O, C, and S keys to get you into those. Um, capital I for insert at the beginning of the line, I to insert where your cursor is, capital A to, to append at the end of the line or A to append right where your cursor is, et cetera. Uh, same thing for shift O goes, inserts a line above, O inserts a line below. Uh, C is for change, S is for substitute. So they're very similar in their, their respects. Uh, and I'll try to fly through this. I know I've got limited time here. So uh, with navigation, you've got your, your standard JKLH, uh, B goes back a word, W goes forward a word, E goes the end of a word. Um, and likewise, capital B goes backwards, uh, w, uh, capital W goes backwards, capital E goes backwards. Um, caret goes to the beginning of the line, dollar sign goes to the line. And there's also little helpers um, at the bottom of Xcode as well. You've got some uh, till and first uh, navigation as well. So if you hit um, like the uh, T open parentheses, so you wanna get you know after the name of your function, but before the parentheses, uh, it, it jumps the cursor to that point, and likewise, the capitals go backwards. You can also change or delete until. Uh, so, if you need to, if you refactored a function name and you forgot to, you know, change it at the call site, uh, you can say CTS or or uh, something would change until the first S, or CT parentheses would change until the first parenthesis. And so, it's very handy to do that. And then, when you're done, you just hit Escape to get back out of Insert mode into Normal mode and move around. Uh, we got visual selection uh, with, um, uh, that's actually incorrect in my slide, I'm sorry, it's not colon V, it's it's V and shift V. Uh, shift V doesn't appear to work well, uh, it behaves exactly like lowercase V does, and basically what that does is it gives you a visual block of code or, or a visual selection that you can either delete or if you select multiple lines you can comment them by uh, you know, holding V and then, you know, J, J, J to go down three lines and then command slash will comment those lines or, or what have you. Uh, yanking and putting, which is similar to like the cut, copy, paste operations. Um, shift Y yanks a whole line, uh, kind of. It doesn't work exactly like the command line Vim does, uh, but yank will yank until whatever thing you tell it, like yank a word or yank to the uh, dollar sign to the end of the line. If you do two Y's like yank, yank, then it's yanking the whole line. And then P will put that line. So it's like pasting. And then uh, if you need to like, you know, copy a line and paste it five times, you can um, you can say like, you know, five P or something like that and we'll paste it five times. Like I said, it is a bit wonky if you use the shift P and then uh, put a couple of times, it doesn't respect the line breaks and such. So it's, it's a little bit different from standard Vim if you're used to that. Uh, some things that 
we're used to in command line Vim or just terminal Vim uh, that don't work as well or at all in Xcode are if you hit uh, colon 10 to go to like line number 10, that doesn't work. Uh, use 10 GG instead, which is a little bit awkward, but still works. You can also still use the built in, uh, the built in Xcode one of, I think it's command L and then type in the number 10 hit enter. Uh, jumping to a corresponding bracket or a corresponding symbol is the percent sign. So like if you, uh, you know, you're at an opening parenthesis and you want to get to the closed parenthesis or curly brace or whatever, uh, the percent sign will jump you to the corresponding one. You can join lines, which is very helpful. If you have like uh, use the, the capital J key when you're in normal mode. And if you have uh, like a single line closure that just happens to like take up three lines of code, you can hit uh, while your cursor is on the top line, you hit two capital J and it will bring that all up on one line, which is super nice. Uh, standard operations like indenting and outdenting are the care keys. You can toggle case by using the tilde. Uh, so when you're over something, you just want to toggle its uppercase, lowercaseness. You can do that. And there's more. There's a Vim bar at the bottom, which will give you a lot of help uh, depending on the width of your screen. So if you have a wider screen, it will give you a lot more help. If you don't, it won't. And I don't think it right now it doesn't. Uh, scroll so you, I don't think you can see uh, the different options. So uh, with all these cool things, uh, there's really nothing more to complain about with them in Xcode. Oh, except for the dot operator, uh, which will repeat the last command you did, which is immensely helpful. Uh, that's it's it's not there. Uh, so I filed a feedback for it already. Uh, that's the number for it if you want to duplicate it. Um, but then we, hey, we've got uh, find and replace, right? Uh, with the uh, the colon S, um, uh, no, sorry, can't do that one either. Um, you can't even do a single line character with the R key to replace it or capital R to, to continue replacing like, a, um, what's the, uh, the old school key on the keyboard? I think it was like the insert key it would overwrite as you typed. Uh, so I filed a uh, feedback on that as well. The save and quit operations or just save uh, colon W. If you're a Vim user, you know that. Uh, my code base is often littered with them before I can remember that I've actually done it. Um, that doesn't work either for some reason. Um, like I said, it's littered all over the place. Colon commands in general, uh, nope, not today, Satan. You can't have those apparently. Uh, same with relative line numbers, which would be super helpful. You know, if you need to go down, uh, like I, I, I was doing some refactoring today, in fact, in one of uh, my networking classes, and I was trying to kind of rip out some functions and replace them, you know, in a different part of the application or a different part of that class, uh, just written differently. And so I, as I would rewrite them just to make sure I could kind of tick them off mentally, I would go down and delete them. And I, I wanted to be able to say, OK, how many lines do I need to go? But now I need to like mentally subtract from I'm going down to line 22 from line 17. OK, so that's five. So, you know. It's super helpful um, relative line numbering when you're in Vim mode. And as far as I can tell, uh, it does not uh, observe anything in like a VimRC file. Um, so uh, VimRC is where you put your normal uh, Vim configurations, uh, but there is nothing like that here. So yeah, that's my gratuitous flame animation in honor of one of the guys at Cleveland who always does that as well. So uh, that's it. That's what I got. Uh, thanks. And uh, I think the the demo, if, if everybody saw it earlier, uh, the what's new in Xcode, the guy showed to um, where to enable that. So I don't have to go through that again. So uh, we'll stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you. For those of you who have noted, I say VIM. I apologize for that. I know it's Finn. Uh, I was an Emacs guy, kind of guy back in the day when I was using this. Maybe that's why I don't know better. Uh, but it was, it was great. Congrats. <laughs> for Apple doing it, I guess. Um, before we go for the next speaker, who is, you know, not last but not least, Joseph, who is, uh, you know, a co-host today, We're gonna talk about Doxy. Just wanted to give you another 30 seconds. If you haven't entered your name, and I know a few, a few of you haven't, please do it now. I, I, will, I will close it down after that. BJ, you didn't get a chance. I know you're, you're speaking. If you'd like to participate in the raffle, uh, you can do it now. Um, and yeah, that's it. Right after this, we're going to go into announcements, and uh, one of them is going to be for the winners. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, the two Cleveland guys closing it out today.
Let me find my presentation. Uh, oh, you guys are seeing this part. How do I share this part? Uh, you can hit X, I think. Yeah, to toggle between the two. You see it now? Or you see my? Or you see my notes? Hit, hit X. Yeah, hit. We see your notes. Hit X one more time. Ah, perfect. So we're yeah. here then. This is where we want to be. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. So um, yeah, I want to start off. I'm the the co-host, as uh, Paul mentioned, for uh, D DCIOS here. Um, and I'm going to talk about the favorite thing that all developers love to do, and that's writing documentation. Kidding. Uh, obviously, it's something that we hate to do, right? We like to actually work on code and not not focus on writing documentation all the time. Um, so let me move some more things out of the way that I have in front of me. But um, digging into Doxy or documentation compiler. Um, so like, what is it? So Doxy or documentation compiler, as it's referred to, um, makes it easy for you to produce documentation for your Swift frameworks and your packages. Uh, the compiler builds your documentation by combining comments that you wrote like in your actual source code with extension files, um, articles, and other resources such as uh, tutorials that live alongside your project next code. And that allows you to create some rich and engaging documents for developers. I should note Doxy is how it's pronounced. Um, not to be confused with the word doxy that ends in XY, which means lover or mistress. Uh, if you're talking about that amongst coworkers, they may get confused. Um, some things that allows you, so it allows you to do um, a lot of cool stuff, both of these, like I said, reference docs, articles, and tutorials. Uh, there's a lot of similarities of, from doxy to, to uh, other app or I guess code pods, uh, such as Jazzy, Swift Docs, or Apple Docs. I'd say that some of these also have some advantages to Doxy. Doxy is still in beta one. Um, so uh, something like Jazzy allows you to create your accuracy level to like including private documentation where you'll see uh, Doxy only allows you to do things that are external types. So some basics of Doxy, um, it requires the latest Xcode, right? Xcode 13, it only works for Swift at the moment. There have been many tweets about this. So it sounds like they might uh, one day extend this to Objective C but who knows, we're only in beta one. Uh, my biggest disappointment, it's designed for frameworks and um, uh, packages only. So after trying this, like the first thing I did was open up an app that you know I'm very familiar with and that I thought was very well documented and tried running the documentation compiler to see how well my uh, app would generate its documentation. Uh, quickly to find out and be disappointed that it doesn't do that. It's specifically again for frameworks and packages. Um, so, this is kind of disappointing for me because this means I can't really create like a how to get started guide for my apps. Let's say uh, I work at Capital One. So if I wanted new developers coming in, they can quickly read that. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to do that. Uh, you know, and maybe we'll see that in the future, but as of right now, that's not supported. Uh, let's talk about how to document and code, um, right? The fun stuff. So uh, documentation as I have in this function right here uh, requires that we do three slashes in order for this to actually pick it up. Um, here I have a header and a return value. So when I run my uh, doc C, I can see that my, like basically my function is created with the header. I have a return value at the bottom of the screen and a declaration. This is basically where you're getting out of the box. If you do absolutely no work, except you've actually write documentation for your project. Um, so that's that is what you'll get. Now we can get a little bit fancier with this. Now I know I'm returning an array of person uh, in this case for this gather attendees function. So I can do this double double tick to link to the person value within my doc. So if I'm looking at this function within my doc called gather attendee, I can now also click on the person value or in that case, the member type value attendee and actually get the definition for those as well within my, docu within my documentation. Uh, you can see the documentation is very much lined up just like Apple's own documentation, which is, which is really cool. Um, now, another part is this, you can see I have a header a space and then a, a third line here. Uh, these are the folks that help run the event uh, for gather hosts. Um, here, I'm taking one more step and I'm adding a, the, a discussion to my documentation. So you can hear, see here under my return value, I also have discussion and all this stuff is really easy to uh, generate if you're looking for these quick templates. So you don't have to you know, do the sl three slashes each time. You can just do command option slash I have to look down because it's it's most a memory for me in like what the actual shortcuts are. Um, 
So breaking that apart, you can see the top is always going to be your header. You have the discussion coming down at the bottom. The return values ring parameters will be there under the declaration. Um, but we can get fancy with this. Doxy also allows you to support markdown. So you can say, see in this little function here called check attendance, um, I'm actually, I have a, I have a bunch of uh, like notes that I put above it, right? Documentation notes. Uh, they include such things as um, tables, order lists, links, headers, code examples. Um, this can get a little crazy. So we'll talk about a way that we can clean this up a little bit as well. Uh, we can see once Doxy generates this, uh, it can actually give you really nice documentation for each individual part. Here I have headers such as speakers, bullet points, and listed, an organized list there, uh, which is neat. Um, but let's get fancier with our Doxy. Like this is basically what we're getting out of the box. If we're just running the compiler, that's what we get. Uh, we can create a documentation catalog. How do we do that? You can do Command N uh, to create a new file and then search for, for this uh, document catalog you'll see here wiggling. Um, and then that will open up uh, basically this little drop down. So this will be added to your project. The bookshelf looking icon that says documentation is, is your catalog basically. And the single book called documentation, which now I see I should probably have labeled something else so I could differentiate them, uh, is actually an article that is uh, basically preloaded into your catalog. Uh, think of it as like a readme for instance, uh, but you can rename that document uh, from documentation to whatever you want. Um, so let's talk about some of the different art, uh, the references uh, that we can do. We talked about uh, articles, extension files, and um, tutorials that we can do. So here with articles and extension files, uh, typically documentation comments in source code describe how specific APIs work, but they like often don't explain how all pieces in a project might fit together at a, at a conceptual level. Adding an article to your documentation catalog is, is one way to include this conceptual content. Uh, articles are markup files that contain information that doesn't relate to a specific symbol. Um, so you should use articles to provide a landing page that includes an overview of your package or your framework, or craft a learning path for readers to understand how to use your project, such as with uh, getting started guide or a tutorial. Um, along with documentation comments and source files, um, uh, which has a lot of benefits writing your actual documentation in your source file uh, as you do now. Uh, in some, some circumstances, it, it makes more sense to separate that content from the source file, such as when you include a thorough code listings or numerous images that increase the size of your documentation and uh, makes it difficult to manage. Um, when your source documentation comments focus on the implementation of your code and aren't appropriate for external documentation. So a perfect example of that is what I just showed before, like in this small function, I have this huge documentation uh, that I wrote above. Uh, so we can clean this up a little bit with an extension file uh, that we can do the same way, create command new and, and add basically all that mumbo jumbo in there. Um, this will make my comment for this function here that's available to developers uh, directly in the code, much shorter and precise, like very specific to what they might need. Um, but in my extension file, what I'll do is I'll specify uh, what, what, what I'm trying to extend uh, in, in regards to documentation. So here I will mark the header with uh, the entire path for that function. So this is happening in the meetup package under the meetup struct uh, in the check attendance function. Uh, and Xcode actually helps you autocomplete this. So you don't have to like struggle with it. Uh, and it's actually pretty good for beta one. Uh, the only other thing you'll need to do is uh, add this metadata part with documentation extension with a merge behavior. Now that merge behavior can be append, which will just add to the, to the documentation that you've already created within your co code or source file. Um, or you can override as I'm doing here, which will of course override everything that you wrote in your um, Xcode source file and override it with what you have here. And last but not least, um, Xcode also provides these new tutorials. Uh, tutorial expands your Swift framework or package reference documentation with uh, interactive educational content. You can create a tutorial by adding a table of contents and individual tutorial pages that walk uh, readers through coding exercises that uh, teach your APIs. Uh, it's pretty nifty. Uh, I'm not gonna dive too much into them because I think I'm already at, at nine minutes. Um, but if you guys come to the breakout rooms, we can take a look at them a little bit more. Um, Definitely shoot some questions to me at uh, my Twitter, uh, Dr. Krejci Sensation. Uh, Krejci did win today, 3-1 against Scotland. So that was a big deal. Um, 
And if with the like last amount of time that I have here, I can actually show uh, one of the projects that I pulled up here. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, this one's perfect. So this is just the one that I was working on. So I can go to my, to, to get your documentation, you can come here to the product. And actually, you guys see my screen still? Nope, no, you're not. Down here, now you're seeing my screen. All right, so I can go to product, um, build documentation, and this will generate my documentation. So here, again, it came up up there. So here, um, as you can see, um, I have both documentation. Uh, these are my articles that I have here, both for DCIOS and iOS Soho. Um, you can link directly to uh, individual articles. And what's pretty cool is that it also supports dark mode, um, which like if you see me convert here, display to, to dark mode. Uh, this is a weird bug. Uh, I have a I have to set the, both the, the dark mode and the light image, uh, but this is a bug that I actually have to like switch back to um, for it to actually pop up uh, in the documentation, which is a weird quirk, but it, like I said, it is beta one. so. Um, that'll be generated for you. Like, like I showed before, you can do some tables, bullet points, however you want to organize this. Um, and it breaks down into all the different the parts you have here. Uh, and like I said, I'll go through some of the cool stuff that they have here for um, the tutorial uh, in the breakout session, if, if you all are interested in that and, and how, um, how that's done. But that is it for me. Um, yeah, thanks again. You did it. Uh, we'll have to watch a recording, but I was doing the raffle the entire time. Thank you very much. You looked great from what I saw. Um, <clears throat> all right. So like I said, I was doing the raffle. So what I did is put everybody in a spreadsheet, run numbers generator out of 52 participants. And I found like 12 numbers. And then I took the raw corresponding and your name is going to show up in the screen very soon as soon as I share. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, sorry, I missed what you said. Um, say again, what were we trying to do? I was just explaining the process, how I picked the, 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 the people. So I'm going to show gotcha. my notes right now with, with the winners, basically. You don't have anything to do apart from celebrate. Uh, <laughs> And we reach out to you, we have your email, and if not, uh, let us know if you have a typo or anything like that. Um, all right, uh, showing that quick now. Ta -da! Wait, do you see that? What do you see? Do you see the... Yep, we see the winners. All right. Well, congratulations to all the winners. Uh, these are... I did by order of price uh, value. So this is uh, apparently like speaking didn't work for everybody, but uh, thank you very much anyways. <laughs> um, all right. We have a couple more things to say about this meetup before we move into, um, again, for these winners, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna reach out to you, right? And, uh, and if we don't, you don't hear from us, feel free to reach out. Um, very quickly, before we move into like the networking session, for those of you who can stick around, I will share the slides again. Uh, quick announcements. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, I mean, at least DCIOS does. Um, and uh, that's where we put all the talks we record. Uh, Joseph is going to share this the link in the, in the chat, as well as a Slack community that is very kind of brand new. There are a bunch of Slack communities out, out there, so not, not that we're trying to compete, but we're trying to bring together all the DC meetups together under one, uh, one umbrella, so that's the idea behind it. Uh, so feel free to join. Uh, we already have a plan for next month, which is awesome, like we've been running behind a lot lately, and, and, and for now, and we have already speakers both for July and August, so we're really excited about that. Um, you see my slide, by the way, right? Yep, we see your okay. slide. I, should, I, wanna, I want to add on to that, too. Although we do have speakers for uh, July and August, um, we're, we're still looking for September. So for those of you yeah. that are, are still learning uh, and picking it up, come on in. I was thought about that right after. 
but basically next month is going to be a bit special. Usually we've got two very technical talks. Next time, maybe you know Alan, he's the organizer of the iOS, uh, iOS Dev Happy Hour, which is a always like every month, like uh, reunite like hundreds of developers from all around the world for a hangout. It's awesome. He's going to talk to us about his journey, uh, how he became an iOS engineer, a software engineer. Uh, so very interesting. And another one, which he, the second talk is going to be a little bit also special, a bit different from usual, which is going to be a little bit of a, a book club kind of a talk where, where uh, Greg is going to talk to us about some ideas he got from this uh, a functional programming kickstart book. Um, we are looking for speakers. Uh, like you just said, Chasit, I created this a bitly, easy to remember. If you are interested yourself in speaking in the future for a longer presentation, usually it's about 20 minutes long plus Q&A. We do two of them, we try to do two of them. If you're interested in speaking or know someone who might be interested in speaking, share that link, use the form. And if you are not interested in speaking, but you, are, you have topics in mind you'd like to hear about, that's also an option. We, we have a little question at the end for that very question. Uh, networking session starting soon. I know not every speaker is able to stick around, but we still will have one breakout room per theme. So that's nine of them plus one for general topic, anything that's not related to today's talks, plus another one for people who might be either hiring or looking for a job, we'll have a, uh, a room for that purpose. So if you are in that case, uh, you feel free to join that room. And uh, I know some people are already planning to be there to answer any questions you may have for companies that are hiring or vice versa. Um, before we move into the networking sessions, uh, I wanted to give you a chance, you know, iOS Soho and DC iOS are community-based. Want to just give a chance to the community to, to share something. If you, you'd like yourself to talk about something, whether you are working on a personal project that you want to share with the group, or you're looking for someone to work on a, a project with you, open source initiative or whatever, something like that. So we're very welcome to talk about it right now or later in, in, the, in the Hangouts. Um, you're not uh, encouraged to say that you're looking for a co-founder or something like that. That's not the point of this meetup. It's really a meetup for developers to hang out together. Uh, and also, if you're looking for hiring specifically, please also wait for, for the breakouts. Uh, you can show your hand if you'd like to say something. Otherwise, we're going to move into the next uh, phase. Any hands? One, two, three. No hands. All right. So I did that already. Networking, the way it works is you're going to see breakout rooms, a list of them. If you have a recent enough version of, of Zoom, I think it's, it's been around for a while now, you should see breakout, uh, breakout rooms. If you don't see it, like uh, we can talk in the chat and we can move you to a specific room. You'll be able to move to any room you want. Um, the main room, the one that with no theme is basically going to be for general topics and if you're stuck and you can move and we help you. And uh, that's pretty much it. I have a huge, huge thank you for all our speakers today. It was amazing. It was incredible. It was really fun and very interesting and we learned a lot. Nine great presentations. Uh, it was a lot to organize. So thank you very much everybody for sticking around and I hope you had a good time. Uh, and I hope we see, see you next month as well, for, for, for those of you who can make it to networking. Thanks so much for putting this on. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Joseph, how does this work next? I think you're going to create the breakout rooms, right? Yeah, there are we're, we're going to unmute. You have to unmute everybody as well, so everybody can say things. Uh, yeah. They'll, they'll unmute once uh, once we bring them in, but I'll open up the breakout rooms right now. You guys can hop in wherever you choose. So you should see a breakout room down there uh, icon with a lot of groups uh, of rooms. One of them being an assign, which is where we are right now. You can move anywhere you please. Hopefully the speakers who gave a talk about one of the rooms are going to be able to go there first. That would be ideal. We didn't talk about it ahead of time, so it's a little bit on the fly. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but even if a speaker is not there, you can always like go there and hang out together, talk about the topic in, in question. And if you stay here, that's where we talk about everything else. Oh, and by the way, to join, you have to hover the number, this is a very bad UX, and click join. I don't think the breakout room button is showing up, at least not for me on the bottom. All right. 
Joseph, do you have an idea? Um, I am, do we, oh, wait, you know what? Maybe we need to, um, let me try doing this. How about I now? To, I'll open our rooms, I can see it. Let's, let's click on this. You, uh, you, know, you know what happened? No, 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 you know what happened? I didn't, um, I didn't give them the option to choose. How about we try now? Can people pick now? I yeah, think we're going to assign you. So we're going to join yeah. another room. You have to hover the number and click join. And if you don't do that, you stay here, basically. And if you need, if you have an older version of uh, of Zoom for whatever reason you still don't see it, we can move you manually. But then you're gonna be stuck there. So let me know. Everybody should be able to unmute uh, uh, now. By the way, if you want to say something, you, you can. <clears throat> How was it? Did you have a good time? That was great. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. I'm glad to join you. again in the future. Thank you for speaking. Uh, this is a, a special, you know, we, we try to do it once a year. I mean, we did it once before in person. Last year we didn't, and this is the second time. Uh, it is really fun to organize as well. Very exciting to have so many, uh, so many talks. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. And thanks for yeah. speaking. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I tried. <laughs> Oh, by the way, you have a room for yourself. I don't know if you want to go there, but there's nobody yet, yet right now. Yeah. The I, issue is that too many rooms, and some rooms are going to have only one person in it, but it's okay. People can always move around. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I kind of have to go anyway. But oh, it was okay. nice. It was nice for including me. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for coming, and uh, hopefully, we see you around. Yeah, hope so too. All right. Bye bye. I forgot to start the recording and do that now.